Professor Shabas, welcome to the show. Good to be here. Wonderful. I was looking to forward to this. I was looking forward to coming and seeing you here <laughs> uh, and to get to talk about uh, black reparation. So I understand that you are currently teaching a class on the civil rights movement and as well as another one on on black reparations. So can you just briefly describe or summarize what you can consider to be the core contents of these two courses? Okay. Um, so both really concern the uh, efforts of people of African descent to organize, to create social change, to improve the material conditions of their lives. In the case of the civil rights movement, we take a long view and look at the development of civil rights movement activism in the early part of the 20th century, from the beginning of the 20th century to the 1950s, when it goes into a really accelerated uh, push, a mass, mm -hmm. a mass level push uh, from the 50s into the 60s, and then begins to demobilize in some significant ways after the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King in April of 1968 and going into the 70s, it is fairly, uh, there's still civil rights movement uh, work going on, but the, the mass level of activism against white supremacy has now shifted in other directions. We speak of the black power movement. Uh, we speak of other forms of, of, of organizing in the United States. And, um, uh, and we also speak about the repression uh, both of the civil rights movement and the black power movement. Now the reparations seminar is really focused on the whole history of the idea of black reparations, uh, of the uh, movements and, and activism on behalf of that, that in uh, it, it really in modern terms, uh, we, we see beginning to develop in the 1980s um, and especially after the, uh, ses the, the murder of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor on the back of a lot of, uh, of, of, of un unaccountable police violence, we really begin to see over the last two, three years the, the awakening uh, and, and, and mobilizing around black reparations. So what's the case for slavery reparations? I understand that uh, prior to the death of Abraham Lincoln and war, slave families were to receive 40 acres and more. Yes. And assistance from the Freedmen's Bureau to successfully transition to freedom. Yes. Uh, are those considered reparations? Well, if you look back at that time, uh, we're talking about the 1860s. Uh, let's first of all establish the fact that the uh, four million plus people of African descent in this country had gone through generations of a crime against humanity. From capture and uh, transporting through the, Afri the slave trade of the European slave trade uh, across the Atlantic uh, into the Americas, and then specifically into the United States of America that, that, that many will trace to 1619, although it had been going on long before that. But from the, that time all the way through the establishment of the U.S. government, uh, the Constitution in the 1780s, and on up to that moment of, uh, of the Civil War uh, in, the in the 1860s, a major crime against humanity. People's labor was taken with no compensation. Uh, people were worked and uh, great profits resulted from that labor, but they received nothing, nothing for their old age, nothing for their, uh, for their survival. And so suddenly in the course of this war, um, the masses of this four million black people, people of African descent, are suddenly uh, thrust into this moment of, of change where the, the condition of shadow slavery 
and being held not, uh, uh, not only in bondage for your labor, but also being counted as property itself. People are able to borrow against against your your value as property. Mm -hmm. uh, you are an asset, and and when that system collapsed, when that system uh, is brought down by the general strike of of African people uh, who stopped uh, working in that system and and supported the war effort uh, to to seek their freedom, this then raises the question of what is owed and who would be and, and when would uh, African those Af same African people be repaid. The scheme that was raised was uh, on the basis of one of the generals uh, meeting in Savannah, Georgia with uh, a group that were designated as black leaders and they were asked by uh, General Sherman uh, uh, as well as by the, the Edwin Stanton, the Secretary of, of War, who had come down uh, from Washington, D.C. for this meeting. They're asked, what do you want? What, 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 what now for you, you know, coming out of this slavery? What do you, and they said, land. Give us land. We'd want to go off on our own with some land and make a way for ourselves and, 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 and be free. This is what will will make things right and that then led to Sherman issuing a general field order field order number 15 that called for when land was confiscated by uh, white uh, slaveholders whites who had been in rebellion um, that that land that confiscated land be parceled out in units of 40 acres mm. per in sla formerly enslaved African uh, people mm -hmm. and that would constitute a way to help them in their transition to freedom. Mm -hmm. In a sense that is really not per se fully the reparations that they were owed but it was at least the uh, a, a reparative framework that came out of this historic meeting uh, uh, near Savannah, Savannah, Georgia, and the the problem is of those that actually were were settled, were given uh, the forty acres. Mm -hmm. um, most of it was subsequently taken back, mm -hmm. and it was never given anywhere near uh, the the four million uh, pl uh, enslaved people. Mm -hmm. It was never given. It was only you know. Uh, um, uh, not even one percent of that oh. were ever ever began to receive it. It was mm -hmm. a start. It was a start in that direction. Congress needed to ratify and support this because just on the basis of the order of a general, that's just under military conditions. Oh, yes. Yes. If you're going to now move that from a military field order mm -hmm. to an actual um, uh, con uh, congressionally supported policy, mm -hmm. it has to go through Congress, and that's where it it, it ran aground. Uh, Thaddeus Stevens uh, was of Pennsylvania was a big supporter. Of, of trying to develop a more generalized policy of reparations, of, of, of remunerating black folks for uh, the, the, the years of enslaved, uh, of their enslavement with land mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, and resources to get a, get a fresh, uh, a new start. But this was never uh, enacted in any, in any way, shape, or form. Freedmen's Bureau itself, when its time limit ran out, Mm -hmm. And it came back up for renewal in the Congress. Lincoln, as you point out, had been assassinated by that point. The new president, Andrew Johnson, who was not favorable to, to, to black people or mm -hmm. reparations or anything of the sort, uh, not even as much as Lincoln, uh, was he there ready to go there. Um, he was, he in fact vetoes mm -hmm. the Freedmen's Bureau. He says that's not something that is needed. That's, he was opposed to the, to renewing the Freedmen's Bureau to carry on. And so Congress had to override uh, his veto. So this just shows the, the, uh, the problems of the period and shows how this uh, uh, that in that moment when reparations should have been paid, mm -hmm. it was it it instead was not, and America did not choose the course of justice. Mm. So now, um, what would paying reparations look like? 
um, I understand that there is a, something called the HR 40 Commission. That HR 40, House mm-hmm. Resolution 40, uh, that was given that number 40 to tie in and to remind us of the 40 acres and a mule mm-hmm. idea, mm-hmm. Uh, it has not passed. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was first entered into as a bill in the Congress in the late 1980s mm-hmm. by a representative, John Conyers, mm-hmm. out of Michigan. Mm-hmm. Um, he brought it up year after year, kept it introduced, but it was never passed. Uh, he has subsequently joined the ancestors and a representative, uh, congressional representative from Texas named Sheila Jackson Lee mm-hmm. has now been introducing it. In the most recent Congress where she introduced it um, with a uh, Democratic majority, she was able to actually get the bill to be discussed within a committee. Mm-hmm. The way bills go in the Congress is they are introduced by a, by a congressperson they then are vetted and analyzed within an appropriate congressional committee mm-hmm. that then uh, makes its findings and and then it goes if if successful it goes to the floor for a vote so it did go to the judiciary committee that could study the constitutional and his and 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 other political implications of establishing such a committee commission to do such a study and make such proposals. It was debated uh, by by both sides of the aisle, the Democrats and the Republicans, Mm -hmm. and it was ultimately passed. It was approved to go forward Mm -hmm. from the Judiciary Committee. Um, But Nancy Pelosi, the Speaker of the House, who has now the power to bring it up to the floor for a vote, has not done so. and so the bill it remains, in a sense, still stalled. Mm-hmm. But it did make historic movement to go through a, a congressional committee and to uh, receive support of a congressional, although a straight party line divided vote mm-hmm. uh, by, the, by the members of the Judiciary Committee. Um, there is a companion bill in the Senate mm-hmm. uh, introduced by New Jersey Senator Cory Booker. It has over 20 out of 100, it has over 20 Senate co-sponsors. These are people saying we would agree to, we, we agree to co-sponsor this bill with you, Cory Booker. Mm-hmm. But again, you need 50 uh, mm-hmm. to pass. To pass yeah. and, oh, and Kamala Harris, perhaps, as, a, as the uh, deciding uh, vote for the majority. And so it has not even moved any further in the Senate at this point. But beyond the question of that particular bill, your more, your more gen- general question of what would it look like. Mm-hmm. Um, the exciting thing is, is that uh, serious scholars, social scientists, economists have, uh, have begun to look at this, this question, going back to one economist named Richard America, mm-hmm. uh, as well as a, who's now in the, among the ancestors, but uh, a colleague of his, Uh, who actually has roots from right here in Amherst, Massachusetts. He Mm -hmm. went to Amherst Regional High School. His father was a faculty member here at UMass Amherst and uh, created our School of Public Health. His name is William Darity Jr. Mm -hmm. Oh, interesting. Known to us as Sandy Darity. Mm -hmm. He, uh, and and, and within, uh, amongst other economists, there have been analyses conducted of the, uh, the amount of wealth that was stolen by a slavery from people of African descent. Mm -hmm. And then they have compounded that over time and interest, uh, you know, with interest and and, and deflated it for Mm -hmm. for the current dollars. Mm -hmm. And the price tag is somewhere, the amount of wealth that was stolen uh, is somewhere in the range of of a little over $14 trillion. Mm -hmm. Um, And that is the, uh, recommendation from uh, Dr. Darity and, and uh, has been looked at by many other economists of the, the, what it would take to close the wealth gap uh, between 
uh, African Americans and the and the the the, the average yes. wealth that people have in this country. Mm -hmm. So it's that's one way that it is looked at in, in financial terms, but that's not the exclusive way we can talk about what, what reparations or reparative justice is. But that's one one major formulation going right now is $14 trillion. Mm -hmm. I see. Um, yeah, $14 trillion seems to be a huge amount of money. Uh, and given the amount of debt that the United States government is, um, I think, there should be opposition to um, the proposal to pay back reparations. So what do opponents of slavery 